Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a uh, special conversation um, with the director of Sing Me a Song, director, producer, and cinematographer, Thomas Balmes. Uh, we're going to be uh, welcomed by Dr. Michael Renov, our Vice Dean of Academic Affairs, who will moderate the discussion. For anyone who would like to ask a question, please just type it in advance into the Q&A box. And then when we're opening um, the discussion up to audience questions, I'll call on you individually so that you can ask your questions live. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. And let's um, have Michael join us and I'll let you two take it away. Thank you, Alex. Thomas, thanks so much for being here with us sharing this movie. Um, it's a remarkable piece of work. I know that it represents a chunk of your life. I'm very conscious of that, even more than most, because this is a return to a subject and a place that you know very well from a decade ago. So maybe for those of us who don't know as well how you come to this place and return to this person, this young person, uh, maybe you could set up the relationship to happiness, and then that would be a, a way in for us to, to talk more fully about the themes as well as the approach that you take. So, uh, well, 10 years ago when I started the project, uh, initially I was even thinking of doing the film uh, in the US, in fact, uh, because my initial idea has always been to work on how relationship with uh, screens uh, and technology and uh, mobile phones. Um, and um, I was for a moment hesitating in doing it in a place where these screens were already existing. And um, after a while, um, after a few months of brainstorming and thinking about where should I do the film, I decided finally to do the film in a location which had no screen at all. And there are not that many places in the world and uh, screens um, in any kind uh, arrived in Bhutan only in 1998, first by TV and later on with internet and later on with mobile phones. And uh, not the, all of the country was connected. And so I thought that uh, this would be more interesting to follow uh, the arrival of these screens instead of shooting in a place which, where, where these screens were already existing. So. Um, I just flew to Bhutan 10 years ago. And um, after the king allowed the screens and TV to arrive in 1998, most of the country got addicted and very quickly connected to, to, to them, uh, apart from a few villages. And among these villages was the one where, um, where I decided to shoot, which was Laya, which was so high and so distant from everything that you had to, to walk for two days to reach it. It was at 4,000 meters high. And uh, I arrived in this village of 900 uh, uh, inhabitants. And um, very quickly, I met Pionk. He was uh, eight years old at the time. And he had never left the village. He had never seen a car. He had never seen TV. He had never seen anything. And he was about to get into this monastery. And so I thought it could be interesting to follow him. And, um, and this is what I did. And uh, Initially, the electricity was supposed to arrive in the next month after the beginning of my shoot, and it took three years. So instead of my initial project, the film became something else. So I always say that uh, Sing Me a Song is not the, the sequel of uh, happiness, but uh, it's more like happiness is a prequel of Sing Me a Song, back, because uh, what you can see in Sing Me a Song is what I was planning to do initially in my first film. Uh, but because of huge rains, which destroyed the roads and uh, enabled uh, the electricity to arrive, I did another film about the, the waiting for that electricity and the waiting for, for all that. Um, and, uh, and so after a few years, I decided to return and to do my original idea. You know, what's interesting uh, it, to, for me, one of the many things that's interesting about your film is something that was sparked when I read an interview that you gave recently. And uh, you, you talked about how one of the reasons you love to make documentary films is because you're constantly being surprised and you're being sent in a different direction from what you had anticipated. Because what you said just now, 
<laughs> what, you said, what you said just, sorry about that. What you said just now no uh, would, would suggest that this, was, that this is a film of abstract ideas. And for most of us who encounter your film and watch it on a screen, it's something very different. It really takes hold of us. It is um, a, a film that depends so much upon the image and it's something that you care about a lot that the image really delivers both story and kind of emotional impact. And so I, 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 the thing that, that, that I'm obsessed with with, this, uh, with your film is really uh, this question about your kind of invisible presence, that the intimacy that, you've, uh, that you're able to achieve when we know full well that your presence is not something that's part of the everyday experience either of um, Bianchi or anybody else you encounter. Now, he, at least with, with Bianchi, he's someone who's known you for a decade and you've kept tabs, kept up uh, in, involved with him. But it, can you explain to us how it's possible for you to be present? And I know you're shooting, you're the one with the camera. So how, how, how do you talk about that the calculus. Talk about what it's like to be present with camera when you're there to observe and you're not there to really intervene. So I would say that the, the key element uh, and what uh, allows this film to exist is uh, how it's funded. And this might uh, not seem that important, but this is like absolutely crucial. Uh, you need, as a director, producer, uh, cinematographer, whatever, to, to know that every single minute, every single day, every single week or month you spend potentially can be thrown in the garbage and never used. You need to have a kind of amazing trust from your funders uh, of a tiny line, which was like, I don't have a clue of what is going to happen to this boy in the next five years for the first one and the next other five years for the second one. But I think that the fact that this boy uh, will go through this kind of different experience should create something interesting. And to have that allows you to really potentially go on a shoot and don't come back with anything. And you can do that once, twice, and don't feel bad about it to be able to concentrate on something which could potentially, it seems uh, nothing, but you just want to follow that tiny line. Uh, and this is something that I've been working on since the last 30 years, is really to be very careful who is funding me and if they have the right intention and understand the way I work. And if they are fine of playing this game, which is to me the only thing interesting in documentary is allowing reality to take the lead and not to pre-write and pre-sell uh, something that have not happened yet. And, and to in, in a way kill the uniqueness of documentary, which is something that you cannot write in advance. You can, uh, you can just say that, trust on me, uh, just look at what I've done previously uh, and just be sure that if it takes me more, uh, twice more, or like two or three years more than what it was supposed to be, I'm going to deliver you with something potentially which is going to be meaningful, but it might be totally different from what I was thinking at the beginning and, and what you were expecting. Uh, if you are ready to play with me with that, uh, reality is stronger than any feature films, you know, but you have to have this kind of openness and every day potentially just take a different lead and, um, and not try on following up a treatment that should have been written to potentially get some funding with 99% of the filmmakers, unfortunately do have to do when without doing documentaries worldwide uh, because of the way documentaries are being funded, which is killing the, 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 the magicness of this media. And uh, what I'm trying to do is just to to, to emphasize and to play with this magicness and to potentially uh, uh, just sometimes do a film in one single day. A few years ago, I was doing a film about uh, Nokia, which was uh, 
a huge budget. I had like 25 uh, uh, countries involved. It was one of the biggest European co-productions and I had a carte blanche from a, a, a BBC and the Finnish broadcaster to do anything I wanted on Nokia, the, the phone company. And it took me like two years to, to know what to do. So I've been traveling to America, to Mexico, to Finland, to finally at one stage find one single day where I could do the all of the 90 minute film. Um, and I did it with a tiny camera, it was in China. It was the first day where the, a, a Finnish uh, uh, manager was uh, checking on the, the ethical situation of a factory in China. And I started to shoot at 10, I stopped shooting at four and the, all of the film was done. To do that, and knowing that you have like a huge budget and many people involved and all that, uh, it's very tricky and to me this is what you need to do when you're doing a documentary and the same thing with happiness and everything you just need to follow your intuitions you just need to to not think too much of what the people are expecting you just need to try to to just follow your instinct and uh, and it's what i've done with this film you know I, when i begin to shoot uh, sing me a song i had no idea that pionki would potentially uh, start this affair with this girl i had no idea that and, and, and this is uh, what I like about it, you know? But to do that, you need to have like people like participants or like Arte in France who, who, who trust on you and just tell you, okay, there is no treatment, there is nothing, but we trust on you and uh, we hope you're gonna find uh, the right story. But I still have to ask you, you've got this rapport apparently with Pianchi that allows you to be in his presence so that he both allows you to be present and doesn't feel the need to acknowledge that presence. And that's a, is that not a rarity? Do, don't most people? I, I, I don't think it is. Uh, it all depends again on what kind of relationship you have with them. And if, if they understand that you are not there to illustrate uh, preconceived ideas or to manipulate something that you want to match in your ideas or whatever, but just to potentially do things and then the next day do something else. If they, if they understand that there is not a kind of a, uh, something that they have to perform, uh, I think reality just happens and, they, and trust uh, comes in the same way, you know? And Pionki, since the very beginning, we developed a very kind of relationship. He has no father. He always called me dad when he's speaking to me. We have something very, very close. And he's always asking me some advice, which I don't give him. I always refuse to tell him you should do this or you should do that. I just let him uh, do what he wants to do. Um, but um, uh, even today, there is not a single day when he's not uh, sending me some stuff. It can be a picture, it can be a sentence, it can be a video he's making in the monastery. Uh, and it, it is not expecting any feedback from him, from me, but um, I think it's just, you know, uh, when we when I start a project like that, I just show my characters the films I've done before, and I speak about the question I have, and then I tell them we're going to be spending some time together, but I have no idea what the film is going to be. And so uh, I think for Sing Me a Song, I think were even easier because he is so happiness, and he was I think very happy with the film and. Uh, and I think it really helped for me to get in even more intimate situation than uh, unhappiness, you know. But uh, I think his mother liked my work, his, uh, the monastery liked my work, so I think everything went very smooth. So can you talk about, there's two moments when Pianchi sheds tears. And so, yeah. you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a sort of, in the kind of work that you do, there's the universal themes that always come through, but then there's also the very culturally specific settings. So like when you made baby, the ba fact that the babies have so much in common and then there's some things that are very different. Now, in American culture, senses of what's appropriate for male behavior, it may be very specific. Crying on camera is not usually one of them. And it's a very particular kind of crying. It's not sobbing, yeah. it's tears fall. And so that's what I'm talking about is the delicacy and his willingness to give himself over to what you call reality, but is reality with a camera. And after all, your theme is what impact do screens have on us? Well, 
you know, he's allowing himself to be what, what and respond in this emotional way in that moment for your camera and eventually for screens. So I wonder if you could talk about that. For me, it was, those are two remarkable moments in the film. Again, uh, again, uh, what I like is uh, when I started to shoot this scene, I had no idea uh, what I would frame. You know, uh, shall I frame uh, his girlfriend? Shall I keep on to frame the two of them and take no risk? I only had one camera. And just organically, without any kind of intellectual analyze, but just something very organic. And it's really connected to the fact of, uh, I think, on the last on the 10 films I've directed since I started doing documentaries, I've never ever worked in a language which I understood. Um, I, I've never worked in France. I've never worked in a uh, very, very short time in the US, but most 90% of the time, I don't understand exactly what is going on. So my way of working and my way of framing and deciding what to do and all that is only connected to what I see and what I feel. And it's a very different kind of filming that I think the average way of filming. And very naturally, I felt that what was interesting is to film him. And I just spent the, all of the scene focused on him. And I had a kind of translation in, the, in, the, in my ear, uh, but it was a vague translation. So it's only later on that I understood why he started to cry. It's just uh, the way she was, uh, telling him, it's not because she had a girl or he was disappointed or nothing like that. It's just, she was super mean with him, like telling him, you look so small. You look such sm so much smaller than on the internet. And, uh, and she was saying to her daughter, tell him how small he looks like. And this why uh, hurt him. But all this came uh, later on, but the kind of, uh, how shy he was and, uh, and the kind of emotion he went through through this moment when she was like so mean and so tough just made me feel like just stay on him, you know? I don't work with Zoom or I have like uh, prime lenses uh, and so I, I cannot just like zoom out and change lenses in such a moment. So I need to be radical in the kind of choices I make. And I just went straight on him and spent like most of the scene on him. And then suddenly he cries. And this is uh, again something I can't explain or can't justify, but just uh, by something which is uh, um, films after films and years after years of shooting, I think you have something which tells you this is what where you should go and this is where, where you should put your camera, you know, and just stay there. And potentially, you know, when you start shooting, when I was younger, I was like searching for things and trying to frame it. And later on, you have like something where you know that the things are gonna get in your shots. And you know that, you know, there is a very kind of different way of like interacting with uh, the actions. And, uh, and you, you, the more it goes, the less I'm working on the shoulder, the more I'm working on a, on a tripod, the more, you know, I, I, and I know that if you are patient enough and you have like in a kind of <laughs> a good energy, the things we're going to come into your frame. You know, and the, uh, the actions we're going to happen into your, in front of you with that. It's really interesting to, to play with that and to be in a kind of meditation and, and, and let it come, you know, and, uh, and this is the only thing I've done. There is no, no, nothing crazy or uh, mystery about it. It's just, uh, I was there and I just let it happen. And it happened the second time later on in the film. And, um, and, and, and at, what, at no stage, Bianchi was telling me, ah, oh, you, uh, he never mentioned all that, you know, we don't speak about that in the same way people are expecting coming from the West, some kind of like crazy moments when uh, for the very first time in one year he's going to meet his mother, which is my case, I was thinking there's going to be some great interactions. She's coming into the room, he's not even looking at her, he has not seen his mom for one year, he's looking somewhere else. Same thing with this girl, he's meeting her after chatting with her for months, He's not even looking at her. He's looking on the other side. There's some kind of a total different kind of interaction uh, that we don't know, and, uh, and which is very interesting to observe. You know, 
um, and uh, I can go back after three years in Bhutan and I know the kind of relationship we have with uh, Pionki is not hugging me or telling me anything, even if I know that uh, I'm someone very important for him. So it's, uh, you have to be ready to, to go through <laughs> some kind of total different kind of thing that you could expect uh, with your Western uh, uh, brain, you know? The second time he cries is when, he's, when he finds out that this young woman has left to, for Kuwait for some yeah. years. And at that moment, you, did you have greater knowledge than he? I knew, I knew she was gone. Yeah. I knew she was gone, uh, but I didn't know it for such a long time. I knew it for like a few hours. Uh, she just disappeared without telling anyone. I knew she was thinking of doing it, but she just went without telling anyone from the crew or any, even notifying me. And this is also very Bhutanese style. She just like uh, uh, disappeared. And, um, but you're right, in a way, I didn't tell him uh, again he's gone. I just knew that he would uh, know it and I uh, was interested in, in filming it and not telling it myself. And you, you knew that that where he was standing, he was likely to see her group of friends pass by. And so that there would be this opportunity for him to gain that knowledge at that moment. Well, I, I know that the only connection he had with her was with this club where she was performing. And that at one stage he was planning to go there and, and meet uh, his friend uh, to, to check uh, on her. So, um, uh, yeah, this is a same way uh, of like in happiness. I don't know if you have seen happiness in the same way when he's going to check with his sister. Um, I knew what his sister was doing and I just followed him discovering it. And I just let her tell him what she was doing, you know? And I let her, I let him lie to his mother coming back to the village saying that his sister was doing fine working in a post office and delivering letters and, and lying to his mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that fascinating. And uh, uh, it's not my uh, role to tell to his mom uh, what his sister was doing. So uh, I'm just there and I'm trying to anticipate as much as I can having people um, on the field when I'm in France uh, and speaking as much as they can with the different characters I'm following, including Ugen and Pionki, to know potentially when Pionki is saying to one of my assistants, I'm really planning to, to leave the monastery. So I'm just flying there to be there on the days he's, he's leaving the monastery. It's not complicated. It's just, you need to be uh, anticipating these kind of actions over a period of X years uh, there are not that many things happening, but if you like putting that into 90 minutes, it seems like a lot, but there is nothing special there, I would say. So how about this? Uh, I understand now much better about you being there with the camera and your intuition for when things will happen and where you should be looking. Then there's the question of standing back and knowing when, what the shape of the overall piece is. Because I've read in an interview that he has, Pyongi has since gone back to the monastery. And so this is an on, this is, a, this is a life of which you're seeing just a part. How do you know where the beginning, middle and end is for this piece at this moment? I never know anything. It's just like uh, in between each shoot. And I, I would say that uh, uh, over the three years I shot Sing Me A Song, I went there like seven or eight times in the country for two to three weeks. Every time I come back, I just edit, edit, and, and then uh, I see the kind of direction and, and the red line of the film, uh, but that's it. Um, and sometimes you come back and, but I've not a clear idea. Uh, at one stage, I was even thinking of flying to Kuwait and do another uh, ending there, you know, and following on the, his girlfriend's new life in Kuwait which could have been very interesting, you know? And, uh, but you never know where to end and all that. And then when you have this scene of him climbing the stairs and all that, you just realize when you start editing it that maybe there is no need to, to go finally to Kuwait. But you only know it when you're, when you're looking at the old film 
and editing that set, set shot, you know? So it's a very uh, uh, organic and very intuitive work. Uh, and, uh, and the more it goes, the more I'm, uh, I'm, I'm editing even uh, live and bring the editors on the, sh on the set and, uh, and not uh, like some people do, just shoot everything and then edit. You know, I'm editing full time, you know, uh, during the, all of the process to be a bit more sharp about what can work and what doesn't work. Well, the camera footage, uh, the, 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 the camera phone footage from Kuwait works perfectly well. I think. Yeah, this is oh, what I talked. Everything we need to know at that moment. For yeah, exactly. Us. But now some people, critics and others have said, wow, maybe this is gonna be like uh, the late great Michael Apted's Up series. Maybe this is a film that needs to be continued at intervals because now we're kind of, we've got two films already. We've seen this eight year old, we've seen an 18 year old. We know he's on the cusp of something, existential crisis. There's gonna be another, no doubt. So do you feel in the back of your mind, is there this sense that maybe that story still continues and maybe you'll participate in that again sometime? Well, uh, really, uh, absolutely, and maybe not. Uh, I don't want to put any pressure on myself uh, and uh, I'll definitely go back. And if in the same way, when I return, potentially to do Sing Me a Song, when I open the door of the monastery, and this is really what happened, I've, uh, you know, I've not, uh, I didn't go for three years, I just go back and I open the monastery door and I see all the monks praying and playing on their mobile phones while they were praying. And just this image convinced me that the film was worth uh, being made, you know? So if I come back in a few years and there is something which is just striking me in the same way, I'll definitely try to, 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 to do a, maybe another chapter, but, um, Maybe maybe it will be very boring and nothing will happen. And Pionki, I don't know what you will be doing and it might not be worse. Uh, so uh, we'll see, I'll go back for sure. And if there is something which I think is worth spending some time and it's not a few months, it's a few years, I'll definitely try to do something. And how do you go about thinking about sharing this film with the people who have been a part of it? Since they are in the middle of their lives and some are here and Kuwait, somewhere there in at 4,000 meters. Uh, is there any formal process, you know, cast and crew? Is there any way that these people will see the film or with their cohort, with their friends? They, they, they already, they, all of them saw the film uh, and, and even like Pionki saw it like many times because uh, he, he went, uh, after I came back to Bhutan to show him the film, even came along to with me to, to Toronto International Film Festival to, to see it on a huge screen and made like uh, three days of press interviews and all that. So um, it was quite an experience. And uh, he, he, I would say that the film even impacted his relationship to, to his phone and to the screens in general. Um, as after, not after the screening, but after three days of being interviewed by journalists who I think kept on telling him and how about the phone were he tell me maybe I should uh, not spend that much on the my phone. It looks like it's not that good. Uh, I think this interview had more impact on his relationship than my film itself. And uh, and now he's being very active with his phone. He's doing a lot of directing and he's uh, doing a lot of uh, special effect and he's doing small clips that he's sending me regularly, which potentially could create some kind of interesting uh, project. I have to say. Um, and um, and he's uh, he's telling me that he wants to be a bit more uh, active and less uh, passive with his phone, uh, but he's still spending a lot of time with his phone for sure. It's remarkable. <laughs> so you have already said that you're a father figure, so he's now he's becoming a filmmaker slash mom. <laughs> Something like that, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I wonder if there are others who have questions for you. So if, uh, if anyone out there would like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and I'll invite you over or put the question in the Q&A box. 
And as we're just sort of getting back into the thick of the semester and it being in the middle of the day, people might be a little bit sort of shy of being the first ones up. While we're thinking, while we're waiting here, I, I, I know, um, Thomas, that, that you, um, one of your early works was uh, with um, Antonioni, that you had had yeah. some with Antonioni. And it really made me think a little bit about, here was Antonioni who had this architecture background, who was very much about composition mm -hmm. and, 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 and real careful about how mise-en-scene would work, et cetera. You're working in a very different way and yet composition for you and where the camera is placed is so important. And I wonder if you ever think about, has there been any kind of influence that you felt from your exposure to the Antonioni approach to cinema? Uh, well, you know, I, I was born in 1969 uh, and my parents uh, never consulted me. Uh, none of them were, they were divorced. I was three years old and they were like big fan uh, movie lovers and they brought me to see the films. Not once in my youth, they consulted me on what do you want to see? So I just went along to see uh, uh, Straub and Wille, uh, Vendors, uh, Antonioni, whatever, but definitely not kids films. So I think I grew up with this kind of pace, this kind of composition, this kind of, uh, uh, and I, I'm for sure been influenced by that. And uh, it's, what is interesting is for that film, I decided to bring uh, on the team some two very young editors to kind of bring some kind of different uh, visual culture uh, and confront it to mine. Uh, because I, I could even like longer shots, you know, than the one I have on this film. And so it was a kind of daily kind of a, a conversation with uh, Alex and Renan about my two editors, uh, about uh, what the right lengths of this shot, you know, because uh, I have been born at the time where you could have like two, three minutes shot, you know, which is what I did, by the way, on Babies. And I was very proud to be able to have such a film being released in 500 theaters in the US with like two, three minutes long shots. You know, it was, I think, quite unusual. Uh, but for this one, I really wanted to have the theme very fluid and uh, very watchable by uh, uh, as many people as possible. So it's still, I think, very slow to some standards. And uh, for my kids, they might find it very slow, they're like uh, uh, teenagers. But I really went as far as I could with my culture in terms of like paste and rhythm. Uh, and, and, uh, and I don't know what is the result, but it's really the confrontation of my uh, influence. And uh, these two young editors were like 20 years younger than me and who have a very different kind of uh, relationship with what is the right length of a shot. Thank you. So we, we have a question from David and he just wanted me to read it out loud. Um, uh, so, he found it striking that there was no narration um, and he wanted to know if that was an intentional choice from the start or something that you just found working on, uh, working as you edited the film. Uh, well, it's something I'd never had. Um, I, 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 it's for me, again, um, um, my relationship to documentary uh, is to, to play with the uniqueness of this media and the uniqueness of this media, I think, is to try to be as close as uh, not to be too radical and to potentially be um, like a fly on the wall, whatever, and, and to not follow any specific dogma. But uh, I'm not doing a feature film. This is not radio. This is not a book. This is this is not journalistic piece. This is like, and so to me, to do this uh, uh, way of narration and to try to have the story speaking by itself is the minimum I can do to, to respect uh, the media. And so uh, uh, it's complicated. It takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, and sometimes people don't even care about it. And you have some uh, cinema critics who don't even mention it. Uh, but it's something uh, that I try to do on every single film I, uh, I've done. And um, even to do, for example, babies with no narration and no dialogues and not a single word for 90 minutes, just raised the bar of, uh, 
what was interesting for me to challenge and to deal with. Uh, and, uh, and the more it goes, this is, uh, I, I, if I could, I could endlessly do films without any dialogues. I find it fascinating, uh, but it's complicated and very tough. Um, but this is where I'm aiming to, I would say. So uh, I'm at least trying the film to work, even potentially even sing me a song. And I've done it a few times to people with no subtitles and to show them the film and that visually the film, is, the visual scenes are so strong that potentially the dialogues are not absolutely necessary. And to me, this is a kind of test uh, of the film if it's working um, according to my standards that the film should work uh, even without the dialogue. So it's the dialogues are just a kind of like a, a bonus but I'm trying to have everything of film I'm doing to work with that potentially any dialogues or any subtitles. Well, that actually leads there is, to there is a journalist. There is a journalist who wrote in the US that my films were like uh, photo books uh, and I, could, I should do photography. I, I, I'm not sure if it was something positive in, in his writing, but I, I take it in a very positive way because I think originally this is more um, my, uh, my kind of, uh, where I come from. It's really the framing and the photographic aspect. So that, that leads into Arif's question, which he, uh, I've been asked to um, read out loud. Can you speak a little about the music in the film? Was it primarily an original score? Is there any possibility of a soundtrack release? Uh, well, um... We've been working uh, with an amazing uh, uh, Swiss, and this is the magicness of uh, international production, you know. Um, and uh, Nicolas Rabeus is a Swiss composer, and uh, we really liked uh, what he had done on a, a few other films. And uh, with Alex, who was very, my editor was very good into uh, working with his music. Um, we, we, we have. Uh, we have finished the old film and we had different kind of tracks. And he, 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 once we had the film being made, he composed everything uh, once it was done. So he arrived kind of very late on the process, but uh, I think he really understood what we wanted. For me to put music on films is something kind of new. On the 10 films I've done, this is only the second, third time I'm doing that. I've done that first with Babies and then with Happiness. Uh, and now I do it with Sing Me A Song. But the first seven films I've done, uh, to me to put music was totally uh, weird idea. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't have such a big experience to, to work with musicians and composer. Uh, so uh, I would really share uh, 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 the responsibility with my editor who I'm much more used to do that. Um, but the only thing I can say is I'm, I'm super happy of the result and that, um, and I didn't want it to be uh, redondant. I don't know if the, if the same word in English, redondant, like, uh, you know, is, is it the same word in English? Uh, okay. and, and this is what we really try to do is really not to, to be too uh, meaningful um, uh, and to, to try to be, to take too much space. So. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the place of the music is somewhere very present, but uh, hopefully it doesn't take too much space also. Um, we got a question from uh, Sandra Aguilar asking uh, to know more about the mushrooms that were gathered in the mountains. <laughs> okay, so the mushrooms, and I'm really sorry for that. Uh, this is one of the kind of, uh, um, difficult stuff to explain uh, on such a short time with no narration, for sure. So this is so incredible and so weird uh, that uh, it could deserve all 90 minutes film just for itself. So uh, since a few years, uh, uh, they have been harvesting this uh, mushroom, which is not really a mushroom. It's a worm. When, it, when the worm dies, it's transforming itself into a mushroom, but originally it's a worm and uh, which is make it so weird and so potentially with magical effect in the mind of the Chinese. And it's supposed to cure everything, you name it, it's curing it. And it's uh, like a Viagra and it's against cancer. It's like, uh, 
uh, and they sell it in between 20,000 and 50,000 euros a kilo. Uh, so this potentially just brought um, suddenly a huge uh, uh, new wealth to the, the population. And the king only allows the Laya people, uh, these 900 people to collect them not only because it's their land, but also because they used to be the poorer people of Bhutan for centuries. Um, and, and, and until very recently, until the, the 80s and the 90s, there were still the poorer people of the old country. And so the king, when this craziness from China arrived about uh, spending that much money on this uh, uh, warm the mushrooms, uh, decided to just allow the, this population of this village to go and collect them. And this is why Pionki is such a, uh, an interesting uh, potential uh, boyfriend for Ugen, is that all the people from this village, uh, having this privilege of being the only one to collect them, are all very, very wealthy now and became the, from the poor, they became the wealthier for the, from the old country. They all have four wheel drives car and they are like uh, just working one month a year to collect these mushrooms and the rest of the time they don't do anything. Uh, and they can live very well with uh, the money they collected. So uh, this is why it's a kind of a dream for a, 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 a girl from the city to potentially uh, marry a, a boy or a man from this village. Mm. Wow. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna welcome over Robert Hansen. Let's uh, move Robert to panelist. Hey, Robert, if you're there, feel free to turn on your microphone and or your camera. Yeah, hi, uh, sorry about my, uh, my video quality here. Um, I was actually just curious about production sound um, and how that was handled, if anyone's wearing uh, lavalier microphones or if that wasn't too, too intrusive. Nope, we had like plenty of uh, wireless uh, mics on everybody uh, and um, I was very lucky uh, at the end of the production uh, to have like um, enough budget to return and spend like uh, a few weeks and go back to every location and with a very specific 5.1 uh, microphone to re-record ambiences in every single location to have like something really dedicated to a potential theatrical release, which unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get in the US, but we could get it in France uh, to really have the film uh, working uh, well in a theater. It's something I was a bit disappointed when I directed Babies a few years ago uh, to not have uh, dedicate that much attention to that and to end up in the theaters um, being a bit disappointed by the ambience and all that. So I really spent much more energy on that. And we had sometimes uh, even two sound recorder um, uh, during the regular recording. Uh, but uh, really this 5.1 re-recording that we made just made it, uh, I think, even more efficient. Um, okay, let me invite over uh, Eric Hansen. Hey, there he is. Hey, just make sure to turn on your mic. Yeah, there we go. All right. No relation to the last Hanson, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, I just wanted to, uh, to tell you, I really enjoyed the film. I was quite moved by it. And uh, I study a lot of that region. So I uh, uh, enjoyed it to a, a great degree. Um, my question you. to you actually was uh, had to do with, do you see it as, uh, as the film as a symbol of kind of the larger sphere of modernization happening across Bhutan. I've traveled in Nepal in uh, the Khumbu and tried to see what they're, this is about eight years ago. So I was kind of curious to see how technology has infiltrated that area or what the changes are afoot there. But just wondering what your knowledge or what your takeaway is for the larger uh, sphere of, of Bhutan. And if you, if you think this is happening across the country. 
Well, I, I always say that uh, really the film, uh, even if it's speaking about something very specific, which is Bhutan, I really made it and directed and everything which uh, brought me there since the very beginning. And I was saying at the beginning of the interview, my original idea was to do the film in the US. Uh, and, and I would say that the film is much more representative of what the US is going through these days, you know, and even like uh, two days ago, three days ago. Uh, in the capital, in the, and, and, and I think it's really much more speaking to, to the whole world about that than about anything specific about Bhutan. Even if it looks like it could only speak about that, but I really, my really original idea, and this is my way of doing films in the sense that I'm not Michael Moore, and this, this can seem very subtle, but um, uh, I, I really see it uh, as uh, something which is allowing ourselves to reconsider our relationship with this uh, technology in general and this application and this network and all that. So um, I would say that um, the, the Bhutan itself is just an excuse. And, uh, and I'm not a specialist of Bhutan. And I think this, the theme, uh, and I will go back to Bhutan to show it there. And we're gonna go uh, through the whole country to, to, to have some screenings, but really what, uh, brought me there and what brought me to spend 10 years of my life on this subject is definitely more us than them and more our situation in France too because we are exactly in the same situation as the one you are in the US uh, and there is not a single country that you can uh, exclude from this uh, situation and um, when you have like teenagers paying 13 hours a day in a rage on screens which is the case today in Bhutan, and that they went from nothing to go in front of uh, Korea, South Korea or China and anything. Uh, we are really totally addicted. This tells a lot about how, wherever you're coming from, whatever your background is, whatever your culture, religion, and uh, where you're starting from, there is no way you can, uh, uh, you can uh, resist uh, uh, the, the, the addiction which is being built in uh, this app being built in the object itself of the mobile phone, which I think is uh, incredibly uh, addictive, even if you get rid of any application and you just have a, a text message in it, you know, it's still something which is in your pocket and can potentially ring or, or, or beep or, and, and it's there. And, and, and this is to me, uh, the only thing I try to bring up, you know, it's uh, how is this boy went from nothing to spend like 13 hours a day doing that, you know? Um, and uh, I've just done that because uh, to me, this is, I, I would say the biggest challenge we all have to face on so many different levels, democracy, uh, politicians, uh, problems that it can raise, um, addiction and how much time it takes in everyone's brain and concentration, lack of being able to concentrate on anything. And, and on a very personal level with my own kids who, with whom I'm dealing with on every single day with the same kind of issue, you know? And, um, and so uh, this is really uh, um, what motivated me. And, uh, and the only thing I can speak of in terms of, of impact and all that, but Bhutan is for sure, and I would really recommend you if you're interested in very specific things about the country itself, uh, a kind of uh, uh, fascinating article which was made in the Guardian a few years ago called Fast Forward into Trouble. And you have like two pages of like, uh, and you can find it on the internet very easily. You have two pages of everything which was brought with the arrival of TV and internet in Bhutan. Uh, how. Uh, uh, depression, our addiction to uh, some kind of different kind of drugs started, how uh, family uh, 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 problems uh, exploded, how suicide exploded, how this is, and you have the whole list and the numbers and everything. Um, but it's really the opposite of what I try to do, uh, as you can see in the film. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I, I just wanted the film to be a kind of starting of discussion and to raise some concern in schools, and which is what I'm trying to do now in France. I'm showing the, the theme in different schools regularly, and we have like uh, uh, very interesting discussions among uh, students. Um, 
and this is the very first time I'm doing that. You know, I, I've done 10 films and never ever, uh, I, I felt that any of the films I've done before had such a potential uh, um, importance in terms of what it was raising as a, a political issue. Uh, and I'm definitely not uh, doing this kind of films, but for the very first time, uh, this subject in particular, for me is uh, of the highest uh, importance, I would say. And also the contrast of that against the study of Buddhism, which you know mm -hmm. concentrates with Maya and illusion. So I think it's a, it's a fabulous way to contrast the two. And it'd be very curious to find out what you know, the lamas of that monastery, how they adapt to this presence over time. Yeah, I, I always say, and it's very interesting that uh, some people tell me, oh, this is so weird that these students can spend that much time doing that, but the, the head lama or the, the professors must be much more, uh, must be hang with them. And, and you know, the reality is that in the evening when I was going in the rooms to negotiate the next day of the shooting with some uh, teachers, they were like not having one mobile phone. They were like in one mobile phone, another computer, an iPad in front of two, three screens and doing the same kind of stuff that the students were doing. So it's, it's not a question of age or a level in the monastery. The, all of them uh, got the same kind of addiction, if not worse, the older they, they were, you know? And the more screen they could afford. Well, thank, you, thank you very much. I just want to say quickly that, that the gender right. split between first person shooter games and online shopping for expensive handbags. I was very happy that that other side of <laughs> the gender split was also represented. Absolutely. Um, okay, we're gonna go out to Jules Minton um, to ask the last question. I All right, Jules, you're on. I see him. <laughs> of course, the uh, can't control their, the mic on the other end. So let's give Jules a second to see if this uh, comes together. Um, and I'll just, oh, someone was asking if you've changed your own technological habits as a result of making this. I wish I had, uh, but uh, there is so much work to do to, to because uh, I have to say that among the, uh, the tech uh, uh, addicts, people are, are maybe one of the worst. So um, uh, I, I just went from two mobile uh, phones full time with me to only one, which is a great improvement. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, uh, I'm trying to 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 really uh, have some kind of windows uh, of disconnection, um, but uh, uh, but apart from this window, the rest of the time uh, it's very complicated when you are working, you know, worldwide. And look, it's ten o'clock, and I'm still it's eleven o'clock in France. Uh, I'm home and, you know, uh, and I need to do that. And I'm working and the film is released worldwide and I need to work with, so there is no way I can uh, get away with this connection and with these screens, uh, uh, but um, I'm trying to, to, to be uh, able to sometimes just turn everything off and spend a few days um, totally disconnected. Uh, okay, Jules, go for it. Oh, um, what you had to say just sort of reinforced this question after I asked it, where you said that you're trying to attempt to go to a uh, to go to a, a documentary form where dialogue is completely unnecessary, and that reminded me that um, during some of the sequences both your thematic idea and the musical score reminded me of Jeffrey Reggio and uh, Philip Glass's collaborations way back in the, what was it, the 70s or 80s. Um, was that a conscious influence? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 
In fact, I watched this very recently, uh, I think when I was preparing babies, so it's like uh, 2005, uh, uh, that uh, knowing that I was about to do a, uh, a non-narrative uh, documentary with uh, no dialogues, I started to get interested into that. But um, I would say that at that moment, doing babies uh, was a big moment and key moment in my career when I started to think that way of like trying to tell a story potentially with, uh, without a dialogue. And, uh, and, um, and the kind of experience uh, of doing it was absolutely on, on the top of everything in uh, babies, there is no drama, there is not real tension, you know, uh, 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 was so challenging and so uh, interesting for me that um, this was a kind of breaking moment, I would say in my way of uh, uh, conceiving my uh, my project and my my work, um, uh, and, and the fact of while I was documenting myself and watching this Jeffrey Reggio project uh, is definitely had an impact on my on my work too, for sure. Good observation. Great, great film. Thank you very much for it. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks, Jules. Thank you both so much for going into so much depth about making this film and for allowing us to share it with our audience. It was really fantastic to, uh, to hear this dialogue and really go behind the scenes. I hope that you'll do this with us again, uh, hopefully Absolutely. in person Whenever. sometime. I think you should, I, come, come. you should come back and show babies. I think we should yeah. talk about Let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. I love that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You guys take care everyone thank take you all care. so much bye bye bye, bye. bye.